Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I am your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and we will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe here on the show that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Gerald Albers of the City of Lloydminster in the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Gerald, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to join me today. I'm always willing to talk to the mayor of the border city as the cross-border interview started in the border city. So I'm always happy to have someone from your community on the show. (laughs) Terrific. We just very much appreciate the opportunity. So I want to start with the, 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 the question I've started all my interviews with, so you're no exception. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? My sense of duty came from, um, you know, being a rate payer, a taxpayer, resident of the community, asking questions and not getting answers back, I guess, is really what it come down to. And, you know, I I felt that there's something not quite the way it should be. And having conversations with local residents, neighbors, a lot, I got the same feeling. And next thing you know, we're sitting down in a business uh, basement asking each other, are you having the same discussions? And that's what we ended up with. And then uh, the media got involved after uh, they found out there was a lot of questions being asked with no replies. And, and uh, yeah, it resulted in me suddenly saying, why don't you run for mayor? And I'm going, hey, I've got a full-time job. I, I don't have this time to be mayor. And they said, well, sure, go for it. And uh, yeah, as the fortune holds, I was very fortunate to be elected in 2016 and acclaimed in 2020. So it was a, it was an incredible journey. Thank my wife and my family and uh, the community. They had faith. Did you ever have a thought in your previous life that you'd ever be the mayor of the city of Lloydminster or was politics ever something that was interested of yours until you had those meetings in the basement of someone's house? Actually, politics has always sort of been an interest of mine. Uh, I, I love history, love social studies and, and the current events. Uh, my family, my father served on municipal council uh, in a rural municipal uh, council in Saskatchewan. My mom served in that same council years later. Uh, so it was around. I got involved in politics when I was young, about 16, 17. Had a chance to work for a political party. I worked in the legislature in Saskatchewan and then got into the working career and never stayed in one place long enough. Oil and gas took us across Western Canada. I've had the fortune of working in three provinces and spending time in the United States to to assist. I didn't work there just to make sure my green card was not involved. And uh, that perspective, but you know, we got here and got settled in. And like I say, it wasn't really an expectation, but uh, lo and behold, it, it came together. And uh, uh, what can I say? Here we are today. Do you mind me asking what uh, uh, rural municipalities your mom and dad uh, were uh, on uh, the council for? They served for? Uh, in the RM of Moose Mountain, number 63 in southeast Saskatchewan. It's about 40 miles from the U.S. Manitoba border. So uh, as you can we, uh, our family farm is located just off the second meridian. So when I live here in the fourth, I can totally relate to talking about the second meridian because I know where that is very well. So I want to go back to that 2016 election here for a second. You said there was a lot of issues as a rate payer that you weren't getting any answers that you wanted from City Hall or from your elected officials. Was that the major issue for you to finally say, okay, 2016 is the year that I'm going to get involved? Or were there other micro issues as well that weren't being addressed in your opinion? I think it was, you know, the, the issues of the day in 2015 leading into 2016, uh, the expectation, you know, I, I ran on the the uh, the principles of truth, openness and transparency. And that's the expectation that I brought to City Hall. And I was very fortunate to be elected with six great councillors in 2016, five of them brand new, like myself. We had one incumbent returned. Who had, Ken uh, Baker, right? Ken Baker, absolutely. <laughs> Ken had served as a councillor, then a mayor, defeated by and then convinced to run again as a councillor when a position came open uh, a few years before 2016, and he he served to fill in the spot. So 
it was a it was a unique experience and the the challenge of uh, what we were facing and certainly there was a lot of concern i can tell you when we had our first council meeting we had about 150 people watching us and uh, that uh, as a, you know of recent we we get down to maybe half dozen online and one one in the gallery at the at city hall so it I hope that trust and uh, confidence that the information that we are presenting, but also the questions that were being asked of administration and the, and you know the response from administration to you know to to go back if needed, if not with the right information, we were able to move forward with the decision. But the ability to inquire and and go from there, and I've made a point of from this point, you call the office, you'll get to speak to me. Uh, if I'm not available, I'll call you back. If you send me an email, you will get a response, and it is from me. Um, you may have some help with the administration providing details to questions. If you write a letter, uh, they're on my desk. They get replied to. And that's the way I, uh, you know, uh, that experience I had from the, the front end working in, in government in Saskatchewan and in, uh, uh, in the legislature gave me a real, I think, a real great ba basis for it. And then just got away from it and got here and went, okay, do what, I, what worked then and uh, it's working now. I want to go to election day in 2016. Going into that ballot box, because I've had the pleasure of doing it, and putting an X beside your own name is a surreal experience. You have to have an ego to, A, put your name on a ballot, but B, <laughs> to go in and put an X beside your own name. How was that experience like for you to, at this time, have only one chance to do it, but was it surreal? Yeah, it was surreal. And, you know, the, the events of that day. <laughs> Having uh, been involved a bit with politics, you know that until election day is over, you really don't know where you stand. And, you know, I said to my wife, there was three candidates and I said, you know, this could bounce either way. I, uh, it, it, you never really know. And, you you know, people said, you got nothing to worry about. And I go, I've been there. I, you have a lot to worry about until the last ballot is counted. The polls are closed. Then if you win, you celebrate. If you didn't, then you just, uh, you move on with life. And you know, the whole, that whole day was one that likely last in my mind. I was fortunate to be joined by family members, both my, my mother and my in-laws and some of my wife's family. Uh, my kids were off at university. So of course they, they were phoning and texting, but yeah, it was, uh, it was an incredible day. And the, the whole process, and I, I really, you know, the, I really hope people take time at the next municipal election to think about running, do some research, and then go out and uh, you know you you're in a position you're literally selling yourself to the uh, to the electorate and uh, it's so important and uh, you know we, we talk about this we're going to be the 2024 is not that far away and the uniqueness of our city as you may get to is we go with the Saskatchewan election schedule even though it's a smaller portion of the city. It's the way the Lloyd Minister Charter is written. So, you know, 2024 will bring some interesting uh, times again. And I, I really encourage people, you know, who can run? And we can have this whole discussion. People ask me, how are you qualified to be mayor? I says, well, I can't find a mayor university, couldn't find a mayor technical school. There's what makes a mayor? Hopefully, uh, a broad background, uh, well versed in some things, openness, to, uh, you know, willing to hear people out, uh, do some research, do some reading, and, uh, you know, hopefully keep the peace in the council chambers when we meet. And uh, that's the job of the mayor. I, I want to talk about apathy here for a second because you brought it up and I want to stay in this realm for a second because provincially and federally, there's a lot of interest in politics, whether it be getting out and voting for your party, but municipally, we're seeing. Election after election, the voter turnout go down. What do you attribute that to? Well, there's a, com a combination of factors. So, um, and, and that's a really good discussion point because in Saskatchewan, we're going to be voting in mid-November 2024. And we're, we've encouraged the provincial government, uh, working with the chief electoral officer for the province to move that date. It's just not conducive to encouraging people to get out. I think people, you know, going back to 2016 and even discussing with people in 2020, because I was out talking to people there, they were voting for councillors. Uh, you know, what, what brings people to the ballot box? Sometimes Sometimes they're unsatisfied. A lot of them, hopefully, it's just a democracy, the, the ability to have that right to vote. And as a mayor, I've stressed that every Remembrance Day leading up to it. 
people paid the ultimate sacrifice. We owe that to those people to exercise our right. Um, you know, what do we need to do different to encourage people? Again, issues tend to bring out more people, but I really think we need to emphasize that every vote does count and every person has that right. And uh, maybe Australia has it right. If you don't vote, you get, uh, you pay it on your income tax. So there's a fine of a format. Um, I really encourage people to do it. And they always seem to have an excuse. Well, I'm going to be away. That's why we have advanced polls. But timing is always a challenge now that our snowbirds tend to head south. Being in mid-November, it's going to be even more challenging for those that tend to vote. It just seems when I talk to, you know, the seniors have lived that much longer than some of us. Uh, they 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 feel that's important. I'm glad they do. It's very important. It's important to young people. I when I talk to students in grade four and six and eight and nine, I encourage them to when they have the chance to vote. And I really appreciate the school system encouraging uh, mock elections. Who would you vote for for mayor and council? And it, it, they do it for school in some school uh, representative committee councils and things like that. But the this education system plays a huge role in helping educate our future voters the, the, the need to learn the responsibility they have to be an elected and good, uh, good voters. We, we we jumped around a little bit here, but I apologize for that. But I just wanted to get that on the, the nope, table here. I want to go back to the responsibility of a mayor because you get elected as mayor in 2016. You get you have some excitement around it because you're elected. You got that yep. blue check mark beside your name. But that excitement doesn't last ever long because you now have the duty and responsibility to make the best decisions for your community possible. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself when you go into that council chambers, which I've been in numerous times, to make the best decisions, but also be wary on how much education you do on each issue without being cemented in your idea of how it should be or how it shouldn't be? That's a great question. You know, I, I've actually shared with people lately in, in the conversations because, you know, that seems to come up. How do you get to your decision? I try and be well informed. Of course, we get the package and, you, you know, hopefully in my role as mayor, I've, I'm in pretty much regular contact with the, uh, the CAO, the city manager, as well as a lot of the administration folks on a daily basis. But, you know, I went into the council chambers and had my mind changed by the discussion that happened by another councillor that brought something forward that I hadn't considered and they it has happened often I, I think I'm pretty comfortable with where I'm, I'm seeing it the information I provided I've been able to form it or and you know had input from people that uh, if there's a specific item that ra is raised in the community more than others and you know that's the nifty part about being on council it, there's so many pieces we vote on yet some people say you have to vote on that yes uh, you know because of the property tax issues uh, cleaning up old taxes as well as bylaws and the processes and how many times do we have uh, a public hearing and no one shows up to say anything so you you take it as such it's not a, a hot button issue in the community. They have faith and trust that you are doing the right thing. And if no one comes to speak to it, you have to feel that we, we've done the due diligence, we've advertised. And it's the hardest part because I go, hmm, when, now I, I feel after I step away, when that ever that is, I'm going to have a responsibility to show up to council meetings just to see what's going on because people need to be here and hear those public debates or hopefully insert and get them going because there's times I wish people would have come in and asked some questions or at least made some comments about an issue where the, the council's voting on it in a form of a bylaw and a public hearing. Is it hard to make decisions when you don't have engagement like that? Because I can imagine, and I'm not bursting any bubbles because you've been in the office for some time now, you're not going to please 100% of your residents on all issues. I am pretty sure everyone knows that. But how do you make engaged, informed decisions for the best of the community when you may not have that engagement that you're potentially looking for? Well, I think it's there's the it starts with administration bringing the information forward at the front end to why this bylaw needs to be updated, why a new bylaw needs to be created, things like that. And you know, some of those it takes time to create. So, you know, issues around uh, lot grading and drainage, which we're just currently dealing with uh, in the process, those have been around since I was here, and I understand they were here prior back to Ken Baker's days many years ago when he first started on council. So some things take uh, come quickly, 
and others take a while to, to get formulated and working through administration's time. You also, hopefully, that if there's issues, you're just being out in the community and being open to it. And we might get to that as, as your questions roll. Like, what's it like? You know, people will stop me. <laughs> every day of the week and from sun up to sundown if I'm out and about and even after sundown you might have some conversations um, it's just so interesting as the role of mayor that you try and get a sense and you know again just talking to the public asking the question how are we doing that's a very simple question you're either doing okay or well hey I'm a little concerned about this or and I think that's that communication factor that there's that sense that the community feels comfortable with what's going on if they're not they'll send you direction and uh, I'm sure the name George Cuff is going to come up in a conversation more than once today you know I looked at some of the things George shared when first elected and you know the information he continues to share uh, you know you, you've got to stay attuned to the uh, to your public somehow however you want to do it and there's various ways and I, I try to get out and I, I know our counselors are out every day because they're not here if I'm sitting here I'm not getting out in front of the public and try to make that point of doing that as the mayor but you know, I look to my council as well. They're, they're the eyes and the ears of the community, be it uh, at the skating rink, at the curling rink, at dance class, or at their own work, or wherever they may run into the public. So uh, I also accept that if I haven't heard anything and they haven't brought anything up in those conversations, we've got a sense that as a group, we've heard from the community. How hard is it to balance the work life of a, and personal life of a mayor of a town like Lloydminster? Because you can't go grocery shopping anymore without someone knowing you're the mayor and stopping you. I can imagine that while you are open and transparent with people, there's days that you just want to be Gerald and go for a beer or go go out to a grocery shop and not have to do a two hour grocery shop for just a carton of milk. Uh, that's there, those, <laughs> you hit it right on the head, Chris. Uh, the one example was shortly after getting elected, my wife sent me for an errand to get a quart of milk. And three quarters of an hour later, which should have been a seven minute trip, was three quarters of an hour. Uh, this past Saturday, I had the pleasure of attending an antique and toy show. And I'm a bit of a, a, a novelist that way to, to keep an eye on those kind of things. Grew up with on a farm and those models are pretty interesting how great a scale they have. Anyways, I was dressed down and my wife always reminds me, you've got to dress the role because you're out in the public. And gosh, I was I thought I was almost undercover, but I wasn't enough because I think eight or seven, nine people stopped and visit and I appreciate that so one thing I can say and I I, I feel for mayors that aren't full-time that's the pleasure of this job I have a full-time job and, and uh, how many hours I work we can talk about that later it's it's what the community needs and I'm able to, to provide it and my wife it, it works in our life today but you know that you you get stopped everywhere and people will either tell you you're doing a great job or and I often you know I appreciate that you're doing a great job and I go uh, doing what and they said oh the parks look great and I often tell people I will share that with the team that delivers that as mayor I mean the, you know I chair the meetings and the roles that I have attending other meetings and representing the city but you know I really I guess I'm the chief cheerleader but also the chief complaint taker and at the end of the day they, they chair the meetings you know uh, the councillors do a great job and fill in where if I'm not able to be there but you know on a one day I changed clothes three times and made five events and I started at seven in the morning and finished 11 at night that was my longest day as mayor and it was a great day because I was out in the public chatting with people making you know uh, hearing from people shaking hands uh, giving out hugs to those that want to hug and uh, you know it's great to see families seniors youth those people all wanting to be out and about do you enjoy that aspect of the job better than the sitting behind a council cha ch chamber table and making the decisions? Because you seem like a personal guy. You seem like an outgoing guy. It seems like you would enjoy that interconnection, but the also, the job also entitles that you have to sit behind a table and listen to report after report after report some days. You know, it's part of the job. Both are part equal parts of the job is the way I see it because, uh, that, you know, the, the, that's part of the major part. Why are you the mayor? You are, you're, <laughs> you're an elected official. You need to make some decisions and get to chair the meetings. On the other side, I'd be as glad to be out and about with the community, uh, finding out because that's back to that communication and knowing that you've kind of got your finger on a bit of the heartbeat of the city. Uh, but again, in a city like ours with 34,000, a young population, we've got 
so many recreation opportunities. And that's why I'm glad we have a great council made up of younger and some older that uh, diverse and, and various stages of their family because you need somebody that's in the arenas and the swimming pools regularly, as well as folks that maybe don't go there as often uh, from that perspective. So, you know, I, the job is, is made by the community. You set yourself to what the community is looking for. I'm sure they'll tell me that uh, if I'm not out enough, I hear that occasionally. You haven't seen yet coffee lately. Hey, uh, thanks for the reminder, because there's also the task of sitting at this desk and dealing with all the issues that go on, as well as all the added, you know, and that's the other piece I don't think a lot of people realize when, as mayor, you may be asked to sit on committees outside your city or represent your city or your community, town, village, uh, or rural municipality at another level. And that's important, too, because it gives you the opportunity to share your knowledge, as well as bring back a lot of great information and put you on a different scale at the provincial or federal level. I want to talk about a gentleman that you brought up here, and his name is George Cuff. I know George. I had the pleasure of sitting down with him for another show that I do with Ian McCormick, and we talked about good governance. And since that conversation, I've asked mayors like yourself, what does good governance mean to Gerald Elbers? So what does it mean? Good governance means openness, transparency, and accountability. <laughs> That's what I think it means to me as I sit in this chair and still reflect on those. Uh, the ability that your decision making is you have the confidence of the community that it's being open and transparent. It hasn't been unduly influenced by anybody uh, from the perspective of going back when people were watching online and we broadcasted, to, I give credit to administration when we started broadcasting our media meetings uh you know so they and they're there you can go back and look at the decisions which i think is so important uh having the respect the council respecting each other because if your council's dysfunctional they, then you don't have good governance either there's a relationship between council and administration and george talks about that lots your best friend can't be the cao city manager or, or administrator but in the same token you have to have a level of respect for each other uh good governance is us keeping our fingers out of the cookie jar uh you know fingers maybe in but dot the whole hand you know have a relationship you know the city staff know who i am and i know a good number of them but we have a fairly large bunch but you know having the ability that the city staff can say hi and feel comfortable hey that's the mayor but i can't talk to him. no you don't report to me you report through the chain up to the city manager but at the same time hey how's things going uh, what's what are you working on and just that relationship that that's open and again transparent because i'm not directing the greater operator as ian will have the question who's driving the greater you know from that but on the same token you know and I, I go back to George I had the pleasure of running into George uh, a number of years ago long before I became mayor when I was a volunteer firefighter in a community that had had some issues and they brought George in and I left the fire department for those issues and you know the same fellow that I met then is the George that you see today he's direct uh, he doesn't beat around the bush, and I appreciate that. And we had the pleasure of inviting George in to do a governance review for us after we got elected in 2016 to really, you know, I had an opinion. Six members of council had an opinion, but we brought somebody in that was removed and could look at it through a different set of lenses and, and eyes and ask the questions and, you know, come away with an unbiased report and say, here you go. This is what we learned. And to this day, most of his... Uh, uh, his recommendations have been in, play, in place, some modifications slightly, and that's, you know, you change the city manager, and the city manager will say, hey, this works, might just shuffle this a little bit, no problem, that's the faith you have to have in administration, but at the end of the day, this is a, it's the most unique job I've ever had, and I've had a different, we've been managing different people and different amounts of people in, in business and business. People say, well, it's a business. I says, it is. It's a customer service business, and the only measurement I've got is whether I get reelected, if you want to use that terminology, or how many times you're beating down my door saying things aren't right, because everything we do, there's a, it's a service provided to somebody. I'm I'm very cautious of time here, and I want to. I, I would love love to continue this conversation, but I want to turn to segment two of the show, and I want to talk about the city as a whole now, and some of the issues that are facing the city. And before I do that, this, I want to 
preface this conversation by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is his opinion. Seem to get a lot of emails about this question for some reason. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In your opinion, uh, Mayor Albers, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Lloydminster today? Today, we are in need of building a new recreation slash event place um, a center. Our main civic center, as you're likely familiar with, is it was built in 1967 as a centennial project. Due to structural challenges of a building that's 55 years old, we've reached a point of life that it's uh, is nearing the end of its life. So what do you do to replace that? And so we've been working on this project and I got to take you back 2019, we as a council, we looked at all, we asked administration to look at all our facilities to get a, a sense of where we were at. And with asset management and as that continues to grow, we got to the point that we need a new facility. So that is uh, front and center. We've applied for grant money from the Saskatchewan Canada ISEP program working with the government of Alberta, because again, each government has an interest in this community and working and sharing information with the community. And that hopefully will uh, be something that comes back to council here relatively quickly once we hear back on where we're at with our, our grant applications so that we can decide what we wanted to, where we want to take the community. And, you know, we've had some great questions and I appreciate that perspective. And that's, that's the number one issue. We've got some other things that are worked on. We've got past it, the wastewater treatment plants being being built and hopefully keep me out of jail federally because the environment Canada likes to throw that out to mayors that uh, if it does, things aren't done right but yeah we're that's the biggest one is our uh, what we call arena slash event place so you're right the city of the government of Alberta and the government of Saskatchewan both have a peculiarly interest in the city of Lloydminster because it straddles both provinces how do you as mayor navigate both governments and i know that is a very loaded question because you have one side that is you have a pst on one side you don't have a pst i know the city of the city doesn't have a pst because that falls under uh the alberta side but there's a lot of regulations that you have to balance on both sides and i know your city charter i've not read it recently but i can imagine your job is just trying to navigate both sides and trying to find a solution that's the lloyd minster solution that it is often the Lloyd Minister solution. So some people say I'm blessed or I'm cursed because I have to deal with two mayors. So I have a split personality or I'm a, you get a half a mayor in each province from that perspective. Bottom line is it, we do maintain relationships with two governments, two premiers, two cabinets, two bureaucracies. It is challenging. Our folks at the administrative level do twice as much work as any other administration because they're filing twice as much paperwork for grant applications, for financial reporting, all sorts of things. That's where council has played such a unique role. We have made a point of trying to have the entire council go to each provincial municipal convention when we interact with the provincial governments because that gives me seven extensions or seven of us going after different things or together when we go into a meeting, the four of seven um, and it's worked really well it is challenging um, my calendar last week I was in Saskatoon next week I'm in Edmonton and it's just one of those things that we we make it work in the city each and every day people often ask us well you're double dipping no we get grant money from the government of Saskatchewan based on their population on that side of the city. Alberta has their funding arrangement, as, as municipal people know, and that covers the Alberta portion. At the end of the day, we put it in one bank account. And it doesn't always equal equal, but each province has been kind enough to agree that when grant money comes in, it can be used wherever in the city it's needed. So Saskatchewan considers the city of Lloyd as a whole to spend money. And we've got projects where it's been funded by one or both provinces on one side of the city, or vice versa on the other side of the city, but it's still one city. And that's what we really thrust for. So it is challenging, uh, but it makes my job unique. And uh, as I tease people, if I can't get along with one premier, I hopefully I can get along with the other. But you're wearing some are only forced with one premier. So, you know, but it's, it is challenging because we try to get the premiers and the governments to work together. And, you know, we've had pretty fair success and it helps when both governments are talking to each other. If they don't, well, then it's a little bit more work for us. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but the education system in Lloydminster is of uh, Saskatchewan is under the Saskatchewan government. Healthcare is also under the Saskatchewan government. So, will you talk to the provincial government in Alberta about healthcare and education if 
the province of Saskatchewan technically runs the healthcare system in and education system in the city? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Work with the school boards from the education side to convey issues that they share with us that they feel they need support from the municipal level. Healthcare is, uh, you know, a front and center, even though it's not a municipal responsibility, it's front and center. So we do, we, and again, um, I wanted to take on um, the last point, I'll just touch on PST and then come back to health. Uh, PST, the former, a former government in Saskatchewan made a zone in Lloydminster that is PST exempt. So it, for most parts, uh, there is a, they collect on a few items that the Saskatchewan government does, namely on ins insured vehicles and things like that but technically you can shop anywhere in the city of Lloydminster PST free so that's I think it goes out to the, Maidstone does it not well I don't think it, the time zone goes out to Maidstone I don't think it goes out to Maidstone for PST I, I won't be I don't want to go quoting on no, that one okay no I, I I thought it was the the time zone and the no. PST but yeah. I want to talk about PST for a second because I saw an interview with you and uh, because I'm heading to Suma in, in April um the city of Lloydminster and cities and municipalities in Saskatchewan have to pay PST. That means you. That means you have to pay PST. So the Saskatchewan government charges PST on cities and municipalities. I think, if I'm not mistaken, only province in the Confederation that does that. How hard is that for you as the city of two uh, two provinces to pay one government and not have to pay the other? So um, we are open up a can of worms. I know I apologize, but I got to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we are fortunate as a city. We are exempt from that PST on those uh, items, even though I have been speaking as the <laughs> vice president of cities for SUMA, representing my 15 other fellow city mayors <laughs> and their communities. But uh, it's, it's put uh, it, it puts me in a bit of an awkward spot from that perspective uh, because we don't pay it. But from the same perspective that uh, that is the rules that have been in place and we're, we're fortunate that way. But it also is clear that I think the province, when they realized that there would be no retail potential retail business on that side of the city if they charged PST. So the logic behind it made a lot of sense when they did it and, I, and they continue to support it. Uh, there's still some people concerned about certain parts of it in today's business world. But from a city's perspective, we're fortunate. We appreciate that that standard uh, because what would happen is there would be a lot of discussion because all of a sudden that where do we put the water plant? Where do we put the wastewater plant? Uh, it would have impacts on infrastructure galore. And, uh, you know, uh, that's how often is that conversation come up? How often does the conversation of where do we put something? Do we put it on the Alberta side or do we put it on the Saskatchewan side? Or do you as the city have to look at the city as not Alberta and Saskatchewan and just Lloyd Minster. And does it come into play more often than not when the Saskatchewan side, and I'm just picking on Saskatchewan here for a second, that would say, well, the Alberta side of our city always gets more stuff. So we have to go over there. Like, is, is there a balancing act that you have to walk or do you just look at it as the city and how do we grow the city? Not which side of the province, but what, what side of the city the city as a whole. We do. We are one city, one team is the motto here at the city with the staff and administration and council. We try to treat the city as a as one. And that's what we tell people. We are one city, Matt, over two provinces as we started the show. You know, it's really what was the infrastructure is laid out and I can get into a very detailed, we can spend a whole half hour talking about how it works with infrastructure because actually there's people on the uh, Saskatchewan side of the city served by ATCO electric and ATCO gas. And that's created no ends of challenges with the recent government programs. But we, we look at the infrastructure and say, you know, we try and balance it as best as we can. We business can come, residents can come and you can choose which side of the city you want to live on. Uh, if there's, this particular if you move from Alberta and you want to stay in Alberta and not have to have your vehicle inspected by moving to Saskatchewan but there's some be there's beautiful homes on both sides there's businesses on both sides so we treat it as one we try back to that comment with the grants with the through the provincial governments we're able to deal with the issues throughout the city working together as one 
it's not perfect on certain things. Now let's go to healthcare. Well, if I may, if I can bounce back there, healthcare is led by Saskatchewan, but we certainly are on conversations with AHS because this is my, my chance to sell this to the provincial governments. If there's anybody listening to your show, surprisingly, they listen because I get random messages saying, "Why did you have that mayor on your show?" So yes, some people in the well, Alberta government and for surprisingly BC, not sure about Saskatchewan yet. Okay, well, I can say this. Where can you spend a 40 cent dollar from Saskatchewan, a 60 cent dollar from Alberta and get a full dollar's value? So that we don't lean on one provincial taxpayer or the other or government treasury, but by pulling the resources together, you get a full dollar's value. And that's on any project in the hospital and healthcare facilities are located on both sides. Some are run by each respective province, but in the case of the hospital, public health are led by Saskatchewan and apply across the whole city. So people, you know, you've mentioned high school, two high schools, both in Alberta, graduate with a Saskatchewan diploma because that's the curriculum they follow and that's what they follow. Yet our teachers attend and school boards attend both school board meetings and things like that and, and provincial organizations because they do talk to Alberta education. They talk to Saskatchewan education. They're funded accordingly that way. Health is the same. Saskatchewan provides it, but they build Alberta Health Services, trust me, and I've heard that from Alberta. And at the same time, we ask them to come together because the, the city is just not the city. We serve an area of 200,000 commercially in, in a business sense, uh, from a retail side, 140 plus for healthcare, 140,000 people converse on a city of 34,000. So we try to bring the two provinces together and say, if you work together, we can do more together. And do you feel like a, a referee from time to time dealing with the two Occasionally, provinces? occasionally. I haven't had to bring the zebra suit out from way back as a hockey referee many years ago. I won't even bring that up. But, uh, you know, bottom line is occasionally it's trying to help two people understand. We often get accused of being uh, the adopted child of two divorced parents. And uh, it is, it is, it's hard. And that's, the, that's the best description. But at the same token, I think, you know, we continue to go through this time after time, helping educate and bringing together. And when we can get two ministers here, the same minister of the same departments together, well, that's a real feat because, you know, they both have issues and we're on the edge of both of them, right? We're right on the, we are, we're on the border. So uh, getting that attention, but I, I want to give the, the provinces credit. They, they're trying hard. And, you know, when we call and to have those conversations, we have two great MLAs, one on each side, have two MPs. For a city of 34,000, we have two MPs, we have two MLAs. And there's a lot of information sharing that goes on on a regular basis. And that's just what, and like I say, it's part of that job. How do we do it? I, we just do it. And that's, uh, it's like I say, it's nothing to people say, are you going to this? No, I can't be at that because I've got to be at another meeting here in Alberta or vice versa in Saskatchewan. And we just work, the, we work it accordingly. Now you've talked about a lot of issues that are dealing with the, the, the city is dealing with, but you talked about the event center as one of the big issues, but dealing with two provinces is a unique entity in itself. But there's issues that the average citizen might have. They might have a pothole that needs to be repaired. They might need a park upgrade grade at the, in their community, in this area. How do you as mayor and council balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the entire city? Because you can't forget about the people who've elected you, but you also can't spend a crap load of money because you can't run deficits and i think every municipality can't and unless lloyd minster is this weird entity you can't run a deficit so how do you balance the needs of the the individual with the needs of the city well i'll take you back to a comment you made earlier you can't please all the people all the time so we try really <laughs> hard we try really hard and i give administration credit we've just went through almost a record snowfall i i haven't seen the actual numbers yet over this past year and it was far from perfect but our teams worked christmas day they worked boxing day they were out christmas eve plowing uh sanding and doing things like that it's it is challenging and we try and back to where getting elected I'll answer people's questions. I often remind people, you may not like the answer you get, but I will give you an answer and try to, you know, open some dialogue if they want to call and ask some questions and find out some information. We do the best we can do. It is a challenge and it's a challenge that we need to, to continuously address because 
it, you're right. Every one of those people pay their taxes, their, their voters, their rate payers, whatever term you want to use. They deserve an answer and we'll try and get to it. You know, our teams, we have, uh, we've got an online system for people to report concerns and they often show up in my desk or in my email bin, they show up in counselors and people get stopped regularly. And I think that's, that's the freedom we have that in this country, that's terrific. And as a municipal politician, I'll say this to anybody that's in that boat, I think we're all there. We are the easiest people to approach. You can see me as we talked about at the grocery store. You can stop me at church on Sunday. You can stop me somewhere and you're going to likely get two minutes of my time. If I give you 10, I'll give you 10. If you need 15, we'll see if we can stretch it that long. And heck, I, I, I've been at coffee shops for more than an hour when, uh, when a group of people, as I like to refer to my senators, call me in for a meeting and want to just either get the information or send some information to city hall and it works both ways and that's, that's the relationship that's so unique about this job i know uh our MPs and MLA spend more time sitting and have to travel. Whereas, like I say, locally as a, a municipal leader, uh, be a councillor or mayor, we know that you, it can happen anytime and we'll, we'll try and balance your concerns to everybody else's. And yeah, it goes on a list and it might be a priority today, tomorrow, it might be a year. And we might say, hey, we're going to get to that. But that's in the five-year plan as we start to look at capital needs and things like that. Uh, it's important to, and all we can do is tell people the honest to goodness truth, share as much information as we can. Uh, people often say, you guys meet in camera. What do you discuss? Sometimes there's legal land and labor issues that we can't, we don't negotiate in public on uh, with unions. We don't, uh, land deals, there's business that has to be some, some direction needs to be given. That's, it's not a, it, I'd like to describe that it's, it's an interaction, but there's no decisions made. That's, that's the uniqueness of this job as there's cabinet meetings and we don't hear about provincial or federal cabinet meetings like we'd like to, but that's what goes on. That's the, the way the democracy is set up and it's a good democracy. I think it's, it's not imperfect, but it's the best we have to work with. My last question before we turn to our last segment here is about the city and I want to know from you, if I came to ask you the question at the end of this year, what would you want completed or started? What issue does the mayor of the city of Lloydminster want addressed by the end of this year, whether it be a project started, whether it be infrastructure in the ground started, whether it be that event center building ground, like the shovel in the ground, what is issue X for 2023 that at the end of the year, I can come to you and say, where's, what's the status of the issue? What's the issue for you? It's that Lloydminster Place event center slash arena complex that we're looking at. Uh, it, it, we've got to, we don't get moving on it. I, it's going to be challenging. We know that costs are going to continue to go up. Whatever we decide to do, we've got to move the project forward. And, uh, you know, the, the civic center, as I say, is a little bit tired. And I just don't want to have an engineer show up one day with a chain and a big lock and say, thank you very much. But your, your its service is done before we're ready to pull the plug ourselves. I want to turn to the last segment here, and it's tourism. I love tourism. I love visiting communities. I've said to anyone who comes on the show, I'm coming to your community, whether you like it or not. I'm coming to spend my economic dollars in your community. So, Mayor Albers, what is the hidden gems that are in Lloydminster that as a tourist you should see? You should come and see our urban park known as the Bud Miller All Seasons Park. That was a project of the government of Alberta many years ago, uh, named after a former MLA. And it's approximately 200 acres that just is incredible from community gardens to gathering places for picnics, barbecues, play some frisbee to uh, tennis to swimming, to walking in the park and being able to see a fox run across with her young ones in her den in the back side of the park, deer grazing. Uh, it just, it's an incredible experience. I think that's one. Second, where else in Canada can you stand in two provinces with your feet less than two feet apart? Only in Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, Alberta, from that perspective. It triggers the question, why? why did a community get put on the border? And the answer is because the community was here before the border existed. That's the simple fact that in uh, 1903, some people decided to settle here. Still not quite sure why they picked this exact spot, but this is where they picked. And then worse yet, the, the federal government of the day in 1905 said, here's the line. And it went right down the middle of Main Street. 
you know, uh, from that perspective, we are Canada's heavy oil capital of the world. We produce the world's best asphalt here in Lloydminster at the uh, Lloydminster Refinery. You know, uh, there's information available to tell you about that oil and why there's an upgrader that sits just outside the city limits. Uh, the governments of the day finally got tired of paying unemployment insurance because everybody got laid off when the oil got thick and cold in the winter. Um, so there's just a few things. We we really on the edge of the, the, the parkland uh, from that perspective, there's, there's a lot of other features, but certainly if you want to know why did the people show up here in 1903, why are calling as they were known, read by, led by Reverend Lloyd and Reverend Barr. Uh, we send you over to the museum and archives and see that firsthand. Uh, we have a great heritage day uh, when uh, we see those old tractors get fired up and see the gleam in young people's eyes and some seniors' eyes because it brings back days of thrashing that for many people, how did they get the grain in? that was through a thrash machine. You see the million dollar combine today and wow, yeah. But you look back at what the original combines looked like, they're a little different and a little different process. So it helps bring, and our community is young, it's diverse, but they also have seniors that are very proud of their heritage as well as some fine sporting uh, activities. We're going to be hosting the 2024 Saskatchewan Summer Games, and there's one of those uniquenesses. Could we host Alberta? Certainly, but we did, and we were fortunate to be awarded the 2024 Summer Games for Saskatchewan. Uh, that very civic center we've talked about hosted the RBC Cup, the Allen Cup, Hockey Day in Canada. We've hosted a lot of events, and we will continue to host events because we have a great community with volunteers that want to showcase their community. Because there's more to Lloyd Minister than simply stopping for a tank of gas, grabbing a bite to eat, and using a restroom. And uh, I've heard that from more people as they've explored our city uh, in this last six years. I've got to talk to people as the mayor said, you know, we drove around your city. You have a beautiful city. We're very proud of our city. It is probably one of the most unique cities in Alberta, in, uh, in Canada, no less. But I want to ask about you. After a long day, after a long day of meetings or council or just being out in the community, where do you go to decompress? Is there a local watering hole? Is there the coffee shop that you go to? And no, you can't say your house because every mayor and councillor I speak to wants to say, I go home and curl up on the couch and watch TV. What do you do? I'm joking. You could say it if you want. Yeah. No, I, I'll tell you, I go home to a great meal. I'm very blessed and it's reflective of my uh, my physique that I have a great cook and uh, a great partner, great campaign manager and a great wife. And she is my sounding board that uh, keeps me uh, pretty much as a, as a steady rock. You know, the community itself, if I'm not at home, uh, chances are I'm at a community event because uh, the invitations keep coming in and I keep trying to answer them as best as I can. You know, back to that, where, where what's my day look like? If the community asks, we, we make an effort to be there. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be at an oilman's uh, bond spiel banquet, uh, bringing greetings to that, uh, stopping by the Rotary afterwards. Uh, they're having an Irish pub night. And, uh, you know, this week I was at a hockey game and a series of meetings. So, you know, every night is different. But, uh, you know, I do actually just head home. That is my favorite spot just to relax and uh, refresh before I might have to go out again. My last question for you, Mayor, is this, and take as long as you want to answer this because it's a, the million-dollar question. What makes the city of Lloydminster such a, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, you know, we've covered so many of them, and I'll try and do a quick recap on that. Being in Canada's only by provincial city, true by provincial city, where the border meets on a piece of asphalt just outside of City Hall's door, like 100 meters from, my, from where we're sitting today to a community that has gone through ups and downs of agriculture, oil and gas, uh, that heavy oil has come with its challenges. There's, it's been great and it's paved the roads of this city and paid for a lot of things, but in the same token, trust me, when oil goes to $10 a barrel, we can't even give away our heavy oil. It's, it actually goes negative from that perspective. The city is young and vibrant. We are very, uh, we attract a great deal of young people. Our uh, mean uh, age is, uh, the medium age is around that 28 to 30, depending on which side of the province you're on young families. We've got some great educational and recreational opportunities, job opportunities coming 
through the door each and every day from businesses. Uh, it's a community that's resilient, that cares. I can use example after example. I think of the Fort McMurray fire when trailers literally got parked along 16 highway and empty parking lots and people filled those trailers with donations. This is a giving community. They've reached out and supported even the projects within the city, but you know, a very caring and committed community. One that's sports minded. I remind people that why are the Edmonton Oilers still in Edmonton? It was a group of businessmen that carried that Edmonton Oilers for a number of years and kept the Edmonton Oilers there because of the work they had done in this community and, and the businesses they had built up. So it's a community that is caring, is open to the business. Um, you know, the demographics of this community continues to change and it's incredible to see the growth in the communities within the community from that perspective and we'll continue to support that as a community. We have world-class facilities and we're gonna to continue to build on those world-class facilities. And we have opportunities in so many fields, education, agriculture, oil and gas and technology continues to lead our way. We've got some great little technical companies that have not just an interest in the oil and gas industry, but also come from the oil and gas industry spilling into others as well as high tech stuff that's just starting to bloom. So watch Lloyd Minster continue to grow and prosper. Gerald, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor to sit down with you for the last 45 minutes and talk about your community. I look forward to visiting it once again later on this year. I'm actually going to be, hopefully, knock on wood, this is airing a week before SUMA, in SUMA, at SUMA, the conference in Saskatoon. So hopefully, if you're around, we can go grab a coffee and maybe I can become your next senator from Calgary representing the great, <laughs> great city of Calgary. Hey, we like I say, it's, often, it's so great having a conversation with people because we are – if not a destination, you're traveling through and hopefully you'll make it a destination uh, one time in your world. But yes, absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you at the SUMA convention. I will have a few responsibilities, but I'm sure I'll be able to stop for a drink somewhere along the lines as the vice president of cities from SUMA. That's what's unique, as well as we, we belong to Alberta Munis. Yeah. And uh, just came back from the SARM convention as a representative of SUMA and a great visit with the RMA folks. So that's the uniqueness that's so great about this job. And I don't, I better not forget our Manitoba friends because they were at the SUMA convention as well. And, uh, you know, as municipal leaders, it doesn't matter what province you're in, uh, where you live in the country. We share so many of the same challenges, but opportunities as well. And uh, working with our fellow urban and rural neighbors, we've got so many opportunities. We just need to, to, to look towards the improvement of building a better community each and every day for everyone to enjoy. I want to thank the mayor once again for doing this. And I want to say to everyone who's listening still, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the cross-border interviews with the mayor of the Candace border city. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, just keep talking.